competence hierarchies. What are they and why do they matter? But yeah, in that chapter I talk a lot about lobsters, which I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of have an affinity for lobsters and because they, well, the, the short story is that when a lobster loses a fight, because they're fighting all the time for dominance, let's say, in their hierarchies, he kind of crunches down, so he looks smaller. When he wins a fight, he stretches out, looks bigger. And so he's signaling to other lobsters the tally of his victories, mm -hmm. let's say. So if a lobster has won a fight, he's more likely to win the next fight than you would calculate from having a tally of all his previous defeats and victories. And if he loses a fight, then he's more likely to lose the next fight. So that's that, that Matthew principle at work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think, well, so what? So what does that have to do with anything? It's like, okay, here, part of the kicker is, well, the lobster runs on serotonin, neurochemical. And if the lobster loses, the serotonin levels go down. And if he wins, the serotonin levels go up. And when the serotonin levels go up, he stretches out. And he's a confident lobster. And one of the consequences of that is if a lobster loses a battle and you give him the equivalent of antidepressants, then he stretches out and he'll go fight again. So antidepressants work on lobsters. Huh. Right. And you think, well, who cares? It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. We diverged from lobsters from an evolutionary perspective 350 million years ago, and it's the same circuit. It's absolutely unbelievable. And that shows you how deep inside you, how basic, how primordial that circuit is in you that's sizing other people up and looking at where they fit in the hierarchy. Well, with human society, it's more like hierarchies of competence mm -hmm. than dominance per se. But, and like if your serotonin levels fall, you get depressed, you crunch forward and, and the whole, everything around you turns cloudy and black and, and then you're inviting more oppression, right? And so you get into this bad loop, you know, and so it's really important to, if you're trying to get your act together, it's really important to stretch yourself out and, and sit up properly because it's, it's part of the psychophysiological loop that can start you on the upward curve. You need to do a postural analysis and, or have someone take a look at you and say, well, you know, yeah, you're kind of hunched forward and you've got to be conscious right. about it. You've got to pull back a lot and open up. Yeah. It's also kind of a... I think part of the reason it signifies dominance is because like this is a protective crouch, right? And it's to stop animals that jump on your back from getting at your soft part. So it's, it's, it's instinctual. It's protective, right? So this basically says I'm open to the world, right? But what it also says is I can handle being open to the world. So it signifies competence and confidence. So hierarchies matter, clearly, and a lot. Where we perceive ourselves to be in the hierarchy determines how happy, how fulfilled, and confident we are. And that's really just part of it. Here's another clip with more details. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting about serotonin is that it tracks your position in the dominance hierarchy as well. So, the higher you are up in a given dominance hierarchy, the more serotonin your brain produces, and that makes you more confident and less unstable. And the lower you are in the hierarchy, the lower your brain serotonin levels. And the reason for that seems to be that if you're low in the dominance hierarchy, well, you should be afraid because almost anything can knock you into oblivion. Because if you're right at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, you're barely, you're barely hanging on and you just can't tolerate any more threat. And conversely, it might also be appropriate for you if someone dangles a reward in front of you for you to grab it because it's not exactly clear it's going to be the next day, there the next day. Whereas if you're up high in the dominance hierarchy, it's like you can take a lot of blows and you're so well situated socially that it's probably not going to overwhelm you that much. And you don't have to be impulsive because the micro environment that you inhabit is very stable. So the competence hierarchy is simply a structure where the most competent people rise to the top of a specific group, domain, or organization. These hierarchies directly influence your psychological well-being and your physical health, for that matter, and much more. One thing Jordan Peterson says about hierarchies that I like a lot is, the dominance hierarchy is a mechanism that selects heroes and breeds them. So here's a couple interesting facts about your brain and the competence hierarchy. Primate studies for the 1980s showed that socially dominant individuals had higher serotonin levels than the rest. Serotonin decreased in alpha vervet monkeys when they lost the submission of the other monkeys in the troop. And lastly, 
Chimpanzees dosed with serotonin, much like Peterson's lobsters, soon became dominant within their troops' hierarchy. And it works the same, more or less, in humans. Climbing competence hierarchies activates the reward center in your brain. If your brain perceives an increase in social status, it releases things like dopamine, serotonin, and other beneficial chemicals that help you feel and become more confident, courageous, fulfilled, self-reliant, bold, competent, able, satisfied, and more. And that's really just the start. What's more, when your brain perceives that you're at a higher level of status, your baseline actually increases. That is, your receptors upregulate and become more plentiful in the brain, leading to a higher baseline in terms of mood, self-belief, ability to handle pressure, all of the above. When a person climbs to the top or near it, it's like the difference between a lion and a rabbit. Whenever you see a rabbit, what is it doing? Its ears are perked, eyes wide open, cautious, and ready to snap into a full leap and sprint away from any danger. That rabbit's brain is filled with all the chemicals that enhance things like neuroticism, fear, stress, etc. Things like cortisol. This enhances its ability to survive, but it certainly doesn't help it climb the food chain. But now, think of a lion. How often do you see that alpha lion, the leader of the pride, frozen in fear, eyes darting everywhere in search of danger like a twitchy, jittery squirrel or rabbit? Pretty much never, right? Because that lion's brain is filled with chemicals like dopamine, which make it confident, aggressive, ready to hunt, and ready to fight. The bulk of the day, the lion is in a state of rest and relaxation. And when it patrols its territory, it's calm, steady. It moves smoothly, confidently. And when it responds to a threat, it does so in a calculating but decisive manner. No hesitation, with an authority and overwhelming power the type that only comes from a severe self-assuredness. All thanks to that lion being in an environment that properly matches his strengths, by the way, and due to his ability to climb his hierarchy. So let's touch on that for a moment. First, let's consider that lion. Consider the jungle that the lion lives in. They say that the lion is the king of this jungle, but it's really not. It may be the king of the savanna, but have you seen a lion swimming in a watering hole filled with crocodiles? Totally different animal. It's swimming for its life. It's scared. It's a scared, wet cat that knows it's no longer at the top of the food chain. For that matter, take one of those crocodiles and strap it into a hang glider. Launch it off a cliff to soar with the eagles and you'll see a similar situation. The eagle is the king of the sky, not the croc. What could he possibly do there? The whole point is that environment heavily influences success. So you really have to choose your environment wisely. But unlike the lion or crocodile, you're human. So you can go beyond migrating to a new environment. You can create an entirely new environment handcrafted to your specific personality and skill set. So how do you choose the right hierarchy for you? one that fits your needs and skill set. Well, let's put it this way. If you're a starving lion, you migrate to a place that best suits your abilities. An environment packed with gazelle and plenty of good ambush terrain, for example. But if you're human, you can build an environment of your own. That might be your own business, if you're the entrepreneurial type. Or maybe a house with a big garage and workshop if you're the carpenter sort or another type of creator, mechanic, or builder. Think Tony Stark in Iron Man, for example. His environment is built to take full advantage of his skills and abilities. So what about you? What's your skill set? What personal needs do you need to meet? There are a number of needs, like the need for achievement, or the need for influence, or power, or the need for acceptance that we all need, and respect, or intimacy. Taking a personality test like Jordan Peterson's Big Five model test, for example, can be very helpful for something like this. When you choose the environment that best fits your wants, needs, personality, and skill set, you've given yourself the best chance to climb your hierarchy. And the crazy thing is, every level you climb means an actual upgrade to your brain. And when you think about hierarchies, 
the best thing you could do is also think about the hero's journey because that's basically what it is. The hero removes himself or herself from society, journeys deep into the wilderness or cave or ocean or all of the above and slays the dragon, returning to society with treasures to share. This is precisely what you do when you choose a hierarchy and attempt to ascend it. Within that hierarchy, whether it's in a cutthroat law firm or a beach packed with surfers or whatever, you'll quickly find your dragons. Sometimes they're found in the work itself and sometimes amongst your coworkers or in your team or maybe your boss or a client. There's always a monster of some sort to defeat and they'll vary in size from day to day, job to job and client to client. It helps to ask yourself what or who your biggest monsters are. That way you can figure out a strategy to cut down the dragon before you face it. And it also helps to remember that the bigger the dragon, the bigger the pile of gold. Ultimately, the bigger they are and the more of them you defeat, the higher you'll climb in your chosen hierarchy. And I'll leave you with this clip from Peterson on the hero's journey. So it's so strange because, you know, people think of evolution from a natural selection perspective, almost always, but sexual selection plays a huge role. So here I'll, I'll lay out something wild for you, okay? So we know that you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. Now people have a hard time with that, but you could imagine that um, roughly speaking that would happen if every single woman had one baby and only every second man fathered a child. So for men it would be you either have two kids or zero. Well that's basically what it is on average across time. If you're a man you have two children, maybe with two different women, or zero. If you're a woman everyone has one. That's how it averages out. So there's more disparity of success among men. And that's very common in the animal kingdom, by the way. Now, the question is, how do women select their mates? Now, unlike female chimps, female humans are choosy maters. Female chimps will mate with any chimp. They go into heat, they'll mate with any chimp. The dominant males are more likely to mate with them, but that's because they chase away the subordinates. It's not because the females exercise choice. Human females exercise choice. And that's one of the things that differentiated us from chimpanzees. But how do they do it? Well, they look at the male dominance hierarchy. And that's where the men are competing. Now, you could say they're competing for power. But that's a pretty corrupt way of looking at it. Like, they're competing for, let's say, influence. They're competing for leadership. And so, in some sense, the people at the top of the hierarchy, if their men are elected by the other men, now I know there's brutes and there's predators and all of that, but I'm talking on average across time. It's like the men organize themselves and there are influential men that rise to the top and the women take them. Now you think about that. What that means is that over the millions of years that a dominance hierarchy with those properties existed, so let's say since we split from chimps, let's say that's six million years. That means that the male dominance hierarchy is the environment that pushes the mating male to the top. So that means the male that's most likely to take precedence in the, dom in the male dominance hierarchy is the one most likely to leave a genetic contribution. So that means that the male dominance hierarchy is a selection mechanism mediated by the female. So what that means is that as we've moved forward through six million years of time, men have become more and more well adapted not only to the presence of the male dominance hierarchy but to the ability to move up it and that's the central spirit you could say in some sense that's the central spirit of the individual the individual is the thing that can move up dominance hierarchies it's the thing that's at the top it's the eye at the top of the pyramid and it's been selected for and then what's happened is that we've watched so we get better and better and better for biological reasons culturally mediated at figuring out how to climb across a set of dominance hierarchies so we can leave a genetic contribution. That's what's happened to human beings. Now imagine that that's happened for six million years. So now imagine that we started to watch that because we're curious creatures. We're always trying to figure out who we are. And then as we watched that, we started to tell stories about what the people who could climb the hierarchies were like. Those were heroes. That's where hero mythology came from. And the biggest hero is the person who'll go out and kill the snake. Well, unsurprisingly, because that was a big hero, man. And maybe when we were living in trees, that was a hero. So the, the big hero is the person who goes out, slays the dragon, 
gets the gold, brings it back to the community and distributes it. He's also the person most likely to go up the dominance hierarchy. He's the person most likely to find the virgin, right? Because it's a virgin that you free from the dragon and you get to claim her, right? And so the dominance hierarchy is a mechanism that selects heroes and then breeds them. And so then we watch that for six million years. We start to understand what it means to be the hero. We start to tell stories about that. And so then not only are we genetically aiming at that with the dominance hierarchy as a selection mechanism mediated by female choice, but our stories are trying to push us in that direction. And so then we say, well, look, that person's admirable. We tell a story about him. And we say, this person is admirable. We tell a story about him. And this person is admirable. And at the same time, we talk about the people who aren't admirable. And then we start having admirable and non-admirable as categories. And out of that, you get something like good and evil. And then you can start to imagine the perfect person. That would be not only so, it would be you take 10 admirable people and you pull out someone who's meta-admirable. And that's a hero. That becomes a religious figure across time. That becomes a savior, a messiah across time as we conceptualize what the ideal person is. And, we, and in the West, here's how we figured it out. We said the ideal person, the ideal man, is the person who tells the truth. And what that means is that's the best way of climbing up any possible dominance hierarchy in the, in the way that's most stable and most lasting. That's, that's the conclusion of Western culture. So there's this story, King Arthur. There's this story of King Arthur. The, they're all in a round table, right? King Arthur and his knights, they're all equals. They're all superordinate, but they're all equals. And they go off to look for the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail is the container of the redemptive substance, whatever that is. It might be the, the cup that Christ used at the Last Supper, or it might be a chalice that was used to capture his blood on the cross, right? When he was pierced by a sword, the stories differ. But that's the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail is lost. That's the redemptive substance. And the knights of King Arthur go off to search for the Holy Grail. And, but they don't know where to look. So... Where do you look when you don't know where to look for something you need desperately but have lost? Well, each of the knights goes into the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And that's Jungian psychoanalysis in a nutshell. It's like that which you fear and avoid, that which you hold in contempt, that which disgusts you and that you avoid. That's the gateway to what you need to know. There's nothing new age about that. That's for sure. Now, Jung, when he started this endeavor, he started with this. This is part of the notebooks from the Black Book. He said, he wrote, My soul, my soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak. I call you. Are you there? I've returned. I'm here again. I've shaken the dust of all the lands from my feet. And I've come to you. I am with you. After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. For the Jungians, the, the hero's journey is a journey within. And, and I think that that's probably the bias of introverts to believe that the hero's journey is an, only an inward journey. I think that it can be an outward journey too because I don't think it matters where you confront the unknown, whether it's within or without. What matters is whether or not you confront the unknown. That's what matters. 